allow me to share with you a brief synopsis of a recently released book, When Women Pray, authored by Bishop T.D. Jakes. Chapter five is a story that gives us details on the life, the circumstances, and the plight of Naomi in the biblical book, Ruth. And there are many, many opportunities that we have to look at this book, but perhaps our focus has tended to be on Ruth and Naomi has somehow succeeded into the background. Let me just refresh your memory for a little bit. Naomi, in the chapter as Bishop Jakes describes it, is facing a bend in the road. She's coming back from a land that she went to with her husband who is now deceased, with her two sons who are now deceased, and she's having to return home. Allegedly, the famine has ended in her hometown, but she went away full, full of family and hope and expectation, and now she's returning depleted and empty. And as she turns this bend in the road, I could not help but think that while it seemed to be deja vu for her, because indeed she had traveled it on the way out of town, we also come to bends in our road. We come to curves that we can't see around and they feel familiar. And it's not always because we've been that way before, but sometimes in our mind, in moments, fleeting moments, hopefully of anxiety or intimidation, we have feared the worst. And when something happens that feels like that is the worst, we identify with Naomi's feeling that I've been through this muddy place, this dry place before. As she goes through this part of the terrain, for her, it's a natural geographic terrain, but for us, it's rough places in our heart, it's questionable events in our life, it's unforeseen and unpredicted circumstances that we must confront. This is no time for Naomi, nor for us, to make a misstep. There's no room for air. There are high cliffs and places where she could fall. And there comes a stage in life where serious mistakes cannot easily be recovered from. Uh, it's not always about a willingness to be resilient. It's just some things you can't afford to misjudge. And so Naomi is coming back, and she's coming back with her two daughter-in-laws from Moab. And she is actively convincing them that there's nothing promising if they stay with her, that there are no more sons in her womb. She depicts an image of herself that is uh, void, that is empty, that has no future. She's somewhere lingering and stuck between the past and what looks like a most dismal present. One of the daughter-in-laws does go back and return, as Naomi has coaxed her to do, and we certainly can't fault her. But the other one begins to pledge her devotion and her pledge to have Naomi's God be her God, Naomi's people to be her people, that where Naomi lodges, she will lodge, and where Naomi dies, she's committed to die. It is a heartfelt commitment that is based on having seen Naomi's obvious kindness to her and her conviction to serve the Israelite God. And so the two return back to town as they return back to Bethlehem, the house of bread, we notice that those who have been friends that Naomi had been estranged from, theoretically, she left a familiar place to go to a strange place, but now returning, having experienced traumatic loss, pain and suffering stacked one on top of the other, the women that you would think would be embracing her with wide open arms are now taunting her in some subtle and some overt ways saying, could this really be Naomi? Is this the woman that had the husband and the sons and that I'm sure one day appeared to be uh, very, very prosperous? And Naomi said to them out of a sore place in her soul, she said, don't call me Naomi, which by the way, means joy. She no longer felt as though her name meant joy. She said, call me Mara instead, which refers to bitterness. Her life had offered her bitterness and what we find all too often, particularly with the elderly, is that when life brings bitter disappointments, it can lead to shame, it can lead to isolation, it can lead to a sad and a heavy weight of disappointment. Naomi feels as though she's been cursed. Her sense is that God has abandoned her. The tragedies are filling up all the space on the canvas of her life, and she has discouraged one daughter-in-law, and the other one has refused to leave. 
But at some point, Naomi sees Woof, the daughter-in-law who stays with her. She sees her dedication. She sees that she has a settled commitment and she agrees to let her come. Oh, what a great thing that was. Because the purposes of God in our life are not intended to be lived out in isolation, but rather are best performed in a sense of community. So what felt like a curse on Naomi's life, and you know the story, as you follow it in the exciting unfolding drama, the way Bishop Jakes presents it, you're drawn into the lines of the page and you breathe in the spaces between the words. And as there you find that what appeared to be a curse on Naomi, this deluge of trauma and crisis after crisis, eventually becomes the very foundation for her victory and for celebration. She is there and she is misplaced. She has been displaced. She is misjudged. And anything that could be missing seemingly is missing in her life. And we would not say that God is responsible for this, neither in her life or in ours. But we do have occasions of disappointment that tend to leave us with a root of bitterness and propel us to a place of shame. But I'm so grateful while we do not have the overt words of Naomi, we still can hear as we put our ear to the narrative that there is a longing, there's a renewed hope, and their whispers of a prayer. And the power is in prayer. We learn that instead God has not abandoned those who are aged, but that he hears them, that he is a faithful God, a God who provides, a God who preserves, a God whose presence is with the elderly, a God who is a proponent of justice, and a God who is a sustainer, and a God who certainly is a rewarder. I'm persuaded that we don't take enough time to concern ourselves with the elderly and with their faith. Medical doctors and psychologists, of course, do what they can. But there has to be a role for the faith community and for biblical theology. It seems to me that with all of the advances in communication and technology, that we should be able to say something and do something about the public that remains largely indifferent to the plight of this increasing population of over 65. Some of the most conservative estimates say that by the year 2030, those who are over 65 will exceed 21% of our population. It's many, many, much too many people to ignore and not provide for. The paradox is medical advances continue. And so most of us are looking forward to living longer than generations that preceded us. And, the, and while there's this excitement, and it is paradoxical, about wanting to live longer, it seems as though no one really wants to get there, that it's the process, but not the end that is so desirable. And so that in itself is a contradiction. Oh, it's easy to give lip service to those who are aging and who are elderly, but we must be careful because often tempers will flare when there's a discussion or a debate about the distribution of economic resources. There's a sense often that the elderly are taking up oxygen, as it were, in the marketplace that belongs to another generation. And there does need to be a sensitivity to be willing to pass the baton and move to another role. It's said that in the later seasons of one's life, that the spiritual discipline that is most valued is that of letting go. And some writers say letting go is not all that it's pumped up to be. But we do know that God does not let us go, that he does not abandon us, that he hears the prayers of the elderly, and he certainly sees the necessities that exist for Naomi and Ruth. And it is apparent in the scripture that there's a need for provision, that there's scarcity when it comes to grain and food. And so the Lord in his graciousness allows Naomi to reach into the treasure of her lived experiences and her wisdom becomes a marvelous resource. Just having longevity does not ensure one of a happy or a joy-filled life, but having years of having heard from and walked with the Lord gives one a well to draw from to overcome the pain of the process of loss and grief. And grief is a natural experience. When we lose the ones we love, it hurts. But when grief becomes an unwelcome visitor, and it's always unwelcome, but when it has stayed much too long, 
Then it's time to resort to the power of prayer and to begin to ask the Lord to share with us the lessons that are to come from loss and the gain that is embedded in that loss. And so I think it's high time for the faith community to offer some correctives to our contemporary society, a society that often uh, feels as though it is in competition with those who are the least among us in some respects, a society that has a growing list of those who are expendable, uh, that can be easily dispensed with, and there's no such thing as throwaway people. If we are valuable in the eyes of God, then we do not want to see our elderly, of which I am a member, begin to lose their sense of self-worth, but rather to understand that there is a treasure, a treasure that came through successes and losses, through trials and errors, through failures and victories, that there is a treasure out of which they can glean and pass on valuable experience to subsequent generation. Naomi, out of her humanity, for a moment does succumb to a sense of self-pity, and we might even say depression, and she drinks from a cup of bitterness, but little does she know that in just a few succeeding generations, our own descendant will be assigned to empty that cup of bitterness. And instead of bitterness and grief gives us the joy, the joy that comes in the morning as replacement for our morning in the nighttime. I'm glad that this story is offered to us in such a vivid way, in such a passionate and in a dramatic way, because we begin to see that it's not curses that predominate our life but it's the spirit of the living Christ that has taken control. And so Naomi, who has said, don't call me, Naomi, call me Mara, becomes not the scourge of the, com the community, but those same women that jeered and taunted and emphasized and lifted up in bold relief her loss became the ones that talked about how God had provided a son for her in her old age. Because every son is not one that we birth in the natural. But you have sons and daughters, perhaps, that if not now, later, you will birth in the spirit. And the marvel of it is that she was able to nurse this child. And I believe that that is symbolic and a metaphor for the wisdom that lies in our past experiences that we should give to others. There's no segment of our population that should go down in disgrace or hide or cower in the corner. But certainly God has seasoned every year in every aspect and every phase of our lives to his praise and to his glory. For we serve a God that wants to promote among us growth, a God that stands for freedom, a God that wants each generation to discover their purpose and their power and to live in a joyful expectation, a God who wants us to be materially provided for, uh, to have the benefit of respect, and yet to know that we can live in a way that is interdependent. Naomi's God is our God. And so we should feel compelled to repeat that outstanding pledge of Ruth as successive daughters of hers and say that her God will be our God and that where she lives, that place of faith and prayer where she walked and abided, that's the place where we want to lodge and live that there's a dwelling place in prayer. There's a dwelling place in communing with the Most High God and where she will find her final resting place, although we avoid talking about it, is the place that all of us want to have communion with the Lord. If I can put in my own words, she becomes the grandmama, not only of the line that will lead to the birth of Messiah, but she becomes a grand madame and lady for all of us who have had bent shoulders and hung down heads to know that God is a lifter, that God is the one who can straighten our backs. And he's the one that can give us a witness to his faithfulness in places that we thought would be our end. This God is our God, even unto the end. I commend this book to you for your hearty and for your beneficial reading, When Women Pray. <music>